Okay guys, a lot of us are stuck in quarantine or lockdown or self-isolation. So I wanted to share 10 backyard astrophotography ideas for lockdown. Doesn't matter if you're in a light polluted area, and if you don't have a backyard, you can even shoot from your balcony or even through a window, like this perfect example by Andrew Peters. So without wasting any more time, number one is light painting with Sirius. Sirius is the brightest star in the night sky. It's in the southwest at the moment and it sets in the west in the late evening, but the best way to find it is to locate Orion and then use Orion's belt to point you in the direction of Sirius. But it is the brightest star in the night sky, so it shouldn't be difficult to find. The only thing brighter than it at the moment is Venus. Now when you look at Sirius, you will see that it twinkles quite heavily. It flashes in brightness and it also appears to change color. And that's because the light of Sirius is being disturbed by the turbulent layers in Earth's atmosphere. It's particularly more pronounced when it's low on the horizon. And what you can do is you can intentionally put Sirius out of focus and then use it to light paint, like this perfect example here by Steve Brown. So once you've got Sirius out of focus, you just intentionally move your camera uh, and you can use it to light paint. And if, if you've got a geared head, for example, I use the Benro geared head. This allows you to move your camera in separate axes. So you could use Sirius as an Etch-a-Sketch. You could, I don't know, write your name or draw a picture using Sirius and, and one of these uh, geared heads, but you can get creative with it. The first time I saw this done was actually Steve again, and he won the stars and... He actually won the stars and nebulae category in Astronomy Photographer of the Year about four years ago with this image, which is basically a bunch of photos of an out-of-focus Sirius and then laid out in this almost sort of pop art fashion. And I thought this was awesome, like a really, really creative way to do astrophotography and, and portray something uh, in a very interesting way. So get creative with it, guys. Number two is moon photography. And the good thing about the moon is that no matter how much light pollution there is, there'll never be enough to wash out the moon. And the good thing with the moon is that it opens up the doors for a number of different photographic possibilities. So you could shoot with a wide angle lens and get a nice sort of uh, wide angle scene of the moon. And if you're lucky, you might even see a halo around the moon. But you can also do some telephoto photography of the moon. So the, the what's in the night sky hashtag uh, a couple of weeks back was full of lovely images of the crescent moon setting in the late evening skies. Uh, so go and check out the hashtag if you're looking for some inspiration. But you could also try a HDR moon. Now I tried this for the first time myself just a couple of days ago uh, and I'll probably make a little tutorial video uh, in the coming days or weeks. But you basically take two separate exposures, one for the illuminated side of the moon and then one for the dark side of the moon and, and you blend them together in Photoshop and then you can even lay them on top of a, uh, a separate exposure taken for the stars. So I'll, I'll probably make a tutorial on that very soon. So if you don't want to miss out on that, make sure to hit subscribe down below. Number three, we've got planets. Now I'm sure you've all noticed Venus in the western skies after sunset because it is shining insanely bright at the moment and it will be at its brightest this month. Venus is going to be hanging around until about May time uh, and if you're lucky you might even catch it next to a crescent moon for example. This month we were quite lucky to have the Venus and Pleiades conjunction, something that only happens once every eight years. But there will be other opportunities to follow photograph Venus next to some other bright stars or perhaps the moon in the weeks ahead. If you're lucky to have a view to the southeast, you can catch Jupiter, Mars and Saturn in the southeastern skies just before sunrise. There's a really nice triplet of planets going on in the morning skies at the moment. Next up we have star trails and this example I took from my very own backyard a couple of nights ago. Now star trails are pretty straightforward but if your camera doesn't have a built-in intervalometer you will need to use an external one and the one I recommend is this one the Pixel 283 or TW283. There's a few reasons I recommend this one. Firstly, all of the cheap intervalometers that I bought in the past broke in exactly the same place, and it was the connection between the cable and the unit, where you put it in your bag, 
and the wear and tear just kind of breaks the cable. But with the Pixar, the cable is removable. So before I put this into my bag, I take the cable out and store them separately. And this one has been going for nearly three years now without any issues. So I have two of these just in case. And the other good thing about these is that they also come with a wireless receiver. So instead of plugging the intervalometer into your camera, uh, you can plug the wireless receiver into your camera. And then you can use this as a wireless remote as well. So when I'm doing a long distance selfie, I'll do it this way so I can fire my camera from far away. But for Star Trails, you basically just need to take 20 to 30 second exposures and leave like a one to two second gap in between each of the exposures. You need to leave enough time to save the image to your memory card. If you have a good memory card and a good camera, you can do one second. If you don't have a premium sort of SD card or your camera is quite old, just leave two to three seconds just to give your camera enough time to store the image and also enough time for your sensor to cool down a little bit because you're going to be leaving it for hours. So with the settings you would do about 20 to 30 seconds for the shutter speed, aim for about ISO 800 and then use the aperture um, that makes your images sort of dark enough. You don't want to overexpose or underexpose, um, so adjust the aperture to make sure that your image is, is nicely exposed. And then once you've collected all the exposures, you can just use the free software called StarStacks to stack them all, uh, and that does most of the hard work for you. If you'd like to see a tutorial on Star Trails, let me know in the comments below. Now, a lot of people commented on my image saying, oh, you're so lucky to have dark skies. And yes, I live in a bottle class five, which isn't bad. But check out this example from London by Joward. So the good thing with star trails is that even if you can't see that many stars with the naked eye, your camera will pick up so much more. And it doesn't really matter how much light pollution there is, you can do star trails. Now, in order to get the circles like this, you need to be facing north in the northern hemisphere or south in the southern hemisphere. But you don't necessarily have to face that direction you can face any direction you want and you can even include the moon in your trails as well just like this example here from minor.pixel so you've got the star trails and the moon as well so this would have been facing west for example and again you can get creative with it guys like for example Daniel Meredith here has put a mirror in the foreground so he's got star trails in the sky and he's facing southwest there and then in the mirror you can just about see Polaris the north star as well so get creative with it now another thing that's worth mentioning is that when you're leaving your camera outside for such a long period of time, you're putting it at the risk of misting up or your lens fogging up with condensation. So uh, I normally use a lens warmer. This is powered by USB, so you just plug it into like a little portable USB battery bank. And then this thing here wraps around your lens. Um, see that? Look. This just sort of wraps on your lens, keeps your lens nice and warm and it stops the condensation forming on the lens. But I'll put affiliate links uh, in the video description below for the, uh, for the lens warmer and the, the intervalometer as well. Now next up is a time lapse and you'll notice for this example here that I've used the same images that I took for my Star Trail image. So again the concept of a time lapse is to take images at an interval. Um, and stitch all those into a video which displays 24 frames a second. So every 24 images you take will be one second of video footage. So again, I'll be using the intervalometer, um, 20 to 30 second exposures, one to two second interval in between the exposures, um, and then you stitch all those into a time-lapse video. There's a million ways that you can do that as well, so just do a little search online. But I will soon be making a video about how to do astro time-lapses as well, because that's one of the most requested things from my supporters over on Patreon. Now you can time-lapse at any focal length with any subject, and if you check the Witten's hashtag, there's a couple of really nice videos of uh, the moon setting and as you can see you can do wide angle you can do telephoto lens and again just get creative with it guys the idea is to display motion over time so, so bear that in mind next up is the international space station now doing a long exposure you'll see the path that the international space station trails in the night sky and you can see this example here which i took with my Google Pixel 4 smartphone. So very accessible thing to photograph. You can even photograph it with your smartphone. And another really good example here from Tony Marsh, where he's even got some car light trails going through his street as well. Now my favorite app for keeping an eye on International Space Station flyovers is one called ISS Detector. It's really, really good. It gives you a nice star map as well, so you can see 
um, how the path is going to look before you plan ahead and, and plan your shot. And it's also worth mentioning, even though I don't want to mention it right now, is that you can also see the SpaceX Starlink satellites flying overhead and you can get photographs of that as well. But if you want to track the SpaceX Starlink satellites, I'd recommend the app Heavens Above. That's similar to ISS Detector, but that includes pretty much all satellites. Now next up is Bokeh Stars. So basically this is the technique that I use in the profile picture that I've been using for the past, I don't know how many years, but it's basically having a foreground subject and then some out of focus stars in the background. And there's some really good examples in the Witten's hashtag right now, like this one from Ellis Wood, who's got Ursa Major and some sort of feature from his garden I guess and another example from starlight captures of his uh, monocular setup as well with some stars sort of blown out in the background so doing a bit of backyard astronomy there and the way to do this is just to have a close foreground subject and it also helps to have a little bit of a longer focal length something like 35 mil 50 mil uh, the other night I was even using a 135mm f2 lens to photograph this chimney with the, the Orion constellation. But it helps to have a little bit of an extra focal length. But you can still do it with 20 to 24mm lenses as well. Just make sure to focus on the really close foreground subject so that your stars turn into sort of bokeh balls. Not poker balls, bokeh balls. Number eight is constellations. Now, photographing constellations is normally quite difficult from dark sky regions because cameras pick up so many stars that you can barely see the constellation anymore. But if you're stuck in light pollution or there's a bit of moonlight, bright constellations stand out a lot more. And you can see in this example from Carol Brown of the Orion constellation above a house. And I took a very similar image with my smartphone, the Google Pixel 4. Um, just the other day as well. So the bright and obvious constellations like Orion and Leo, Cassiopeia, Ursa Major, they will stand out really well even in light pollution or sort of moonlit skies. Next up is a, a daytime astrophotography idea in that you can, you can either make your own pinhole camera or you can get yourself one of these which is a solar can. And I've had this for like the better part of a year and I've been meaning to use it and I was really annoyed because I was going to go to Chile for the solar eclipse. Um, but it's basically a, a pinhole camera in a, in a can. You, you sort of set it up outside, you strap it, strap it to a pole or something outside using the, uh, the zip ties to come with it. And then once you're set up, you peel off this little black tab and underneath there is a little pinhole and inside the can is a piece of film and this basically will take a photograph and the minimum exposure time is about a week you have to leave it outside for at least a week but you can leave it outside for a month or maybe a year and you basically get images that show the path of the sun in the sky and this is why i wanted to use it in chile for the solar eclipse because it would have been really cool to see the path disappear and then reappear but I totally forgot to pack it but I think I'm gonna set this up pretty soon uh, on my house and maybe leave it there for the duration of uh, the lockdown here in the UK because then I'll have an image that kind of depicts all of this time um, spent at home and I'll capture every sunrise and every sunset that happened uh, during the lockdown and finally guys, number 10 is deep space astrophotography. Now you'd be quite surprised with the right light pollution filter. Um, you can actually get some really incredible deep space astro photographs. And if you have an astro modified camera, you could even do narrow band astrophotography. So for example, you can use a filter that only allows the wavelengths of light corresponding to hydrogen alpha emissions through the filter and then you can take hydrogen alpha images even in heavy light pollution and on nights when there's a full moon. I'm no expert in deep space astrophotography, I've only really dabbled. You should really check out the, the, the deep space astro channels on YouTube uh, like Backyard Astrophotography or Peter Zelinka or Dylan O'Donnell. I mean these guys are far more centric around deep space astrophotography so I highly recommend you check those guys out. I think you guys might be quite surprised how good an image you can take even in 
and light polluted night skies. But that's it guys, that is 10 ideas for backyard astrophotography to do during lockdown. If any of those ideas was new to you, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe because I'll be making tutorials about some of these things that I've mentioned. There's loads of good videos coming and a huge thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon and making this channel possible. If you're going out to enjoy the night sky anytime soon, I wish you good luck and clear skies. Yeah.